tell from the fact that I got an MSc, uh, I'm quite Jurassic in London Business School terms. Uh, because uh, it, it, there wasn't the M MBA course at that time. It was called MSc. Um, uh, thank you for this invitation. Um, I think it's an underlying theme of virtually every public policy in the world that uh, they want to provide um, society with safe, secure, stable energy at affordable prices for consumers and competitive prices for business. That just sums it up completely. And the, the next stage you might say is, well, OK, let markets work everywhere, globally, nationally. Uh, let innovation take place. Uh, get your energy future in your own hands as an individual or, a, or, or as, a, as, a, as a company at a, at a level of a small business or a large business. Um, and that's um, an attractive vision. Um, the reality is that the energy industry, the energy sector, is still quite complex. And uh, I'd like to say at the beginning that it would be very difficult to imagine that this markets could simply work without a very significant um, degree of regulation, either in terms of keeping this, the markets working or regulation to incentivize or to support innovation in certain directions which actually lead to the outcomes which society wants. And um, whether it's the fact that it's uh, an industry which requires huge long-term investments gen in generations from 20 to 60 years life cycle, in um, the fact that it's a network industry, uh, the fact that there are system stability problems, and I, I agree, they shouldn't be exaggerated to frustrate competition. On the other hand, um, when the lights go out and when the heating goes off, uh, life does become quite exciting, <laughs> usually for officials at uh, national or at European level. And I can come back to that when we talk about gas, um, as I um, frequently have to go to Moscow to make sure that there isn't any a tap being turned off. And of course, um, if you look at it in market terms too, um, exposure to global markets brings with it necessarily a certain degree of volatility, given the fact that the sources of fossil fuels are distributed um, uh, not according to um, the level of commercial risk, but according to uh, probably a progressive scale of political instability. Um, and that's something to bear in mind, too, in terms of import dependence. And finally, as the panelists is discussed on the consumer side, um, whether it's, uh, frankly, individual consumers or businesses, uh, there's not just simple basic information asymmetry compared with suppliers. There's a real issue of behavior and uh, capacity not just to be informed, but to be aware and be incentivized to do things which are in your own interests as well as maybe collectively in a wider interest. And of course, the, the biggest externality of all is the one which is uh, present in virtually every energy uh, discussion. Uh, it's the additions of the word and climate change, <laughs> um, meaning uh, energy policy should be uh, oriented specifically to climate change, which, of course, I think compared with maybe five or six years ago is somewhat qualified in p political debate today. People are a lot more worried about inf affordability. They're a lot more worried about security of supply. And certainly uh, they are very concerned to see that the energy sector actually provides competitiveness uh, and simply doesn't provide um, a contribution to a global challenge while leaving um, us in a situation where if we save the world, um, we may not save ourselves. Now, of course, uh, technology is the great, and innovation is the great enabler in principle, and public policy should be the great facilitator, although it can be a great frustrator. Public acceptance is a major dimensioning uh, factor 
on what can go on in the energy sector. And then markets decide. And sometimes the combination of these four factors is quite extraordinarily positive. And sometimes there are un unintended consequences which are quite dramatic. Um, i just give you two examples. Uh, we talked earlier about fuel quality, fuel efficiency standards in the car sector. That's been very positively pushed, first of all, by the emphasis on fuel e efficiency and standards at a European level through legislation, then through the drive to get CO2 emissions down, uh, and in fact the industry has outperformed the standards which it, has, which it grumbled about some, some years ago in actually achieving a result. That's very positive. Look at uh, a story which is slightly more difficult to explain. Shale gas uh, promotes uh, use of gas for power production in the States, diverts coal <coughs> to Europe, Coal is driving the electricity price in Europe today. Throughout Europe, it is coal for the moment, combined with um, the low level of the carbon price in the ETS system. Um, and that is um, a rather um, unintended consequence, given the fact that uh, we see now that y the US reduced its CO2 emissions last year, whereas the EU increased them. And bearing in mind that the EU is uh, only responsible for 11% of CO2 emissions globally today, that is the 27 member states of the EU, um, in 2030, that's likely to be 4%. So uh, in sense of suggesting that there is going to be a immediate global impact of a regional solution, that's not clear without us being uh, clear what our global strategy is in terms of negotiation of uh, further reductions in CO2. And what makes sense for us as, a, as a, a set of nations which have broadly converging um, challenges before them, and this is where I start the, um, the, the, the presentation. Uh, the, this graph looks as if it's, uh, the, the, the supply challenge is flat. In fact, the, the total amount is growing exponentially during, uh, due to the, due to the um, demand in, in Asia and the OECD countries. As this graph from the World Energy Outlook, which was published uh, 10 days ago by the IEA, uh, shows the OECD countries' share is uh, rapidly decreasing. And it's likely that every form of energy, whether it's renewable or, or conventional, will um, find its way to, to Asia, first of all, in terms of price incentive, including um, as far as, um, uh, including in particular, something which we could even discuss in the panel, we'll certainly discuss this afternoon, whether shale gas could be exported or unconventional gas could be exported from the US uh, elsewhere. Maybe, but the price differential uh, for, between Europe and Japan is so significant that it's likely that um, the, the major flows will go to Asia and not come to the European Union. And uh, the price of pipeline gas in, in Europe remains very, very significant. Now, if, if you look at the issue of competitiveness for European industry is against US industry and elsewhere. Energy prices in Europe are driven by global trends. Um, the increases in, in energy prices have been much higher than in, than in many developed countries. And um, the impacts of, of unconventional gas are causing some concern as to how um, Europe maintains this, um, its present competitive com position while at the same time tackling its sustainability challenge. And if you look at it in terms of, of um, the import dependence, which is, of course, not in principle a problem because we're in a multilateral trading system, but um, if you look at the import dependence of, of all the EU's member states on, on uh, fossil fuels from outside <laughs> the EU, due to depletion of, uh, of uh, national reserves inside the EU, um, 
we are, are increasingly becoming behind Japan, the area of the world which is likely to be most dependent and most subject, susceptible to the uh, s supply problems and price uh, changes at a global level. And this is um, this varies from member state to member state. You can imagine that um, somewhere like Malta, which is 100% dependent for the moment on on uh, uh, on uh, fossil fuels, and and it has not yet developed interconnection elsewhere. That's a major problem. In Bulgaria, we have 100% uh, um, dependency on one source of of gas from Russia. Five or six other member states are in a similar position, and um, there is a current dependency in the UK here of 28%. I don't think that is a major source of concern, but if you look at it in terms of the, the phase-out of different capacities, legacy capacities, it could be. At the same time, we say, right, we, we take climate change seriously. We've been a, in a front-runner at a, at a global level in negotiating um, Kyoto and post-Kyoto um, targets and um, the aim of actually reducing CO2 emissions to um, 80 to 95 percent of, of, of uh, the 1990 levels is still one which uh, every single <coughs> head of state signs up to because it's the one which is consistent with uh, simply a two degree uh, centigrade um, increase in global temperatures while, as you know, we're heading at the moment for a six degree increase in global temperatures. Um, so are we in a carbon bubble situation or are we, um, uh, is there any, scient any scientific evidence which would actually point to a different strategy? Um, even in relation to the sustainability challenge, we, on current policies, um, are, uh, are likely only to reach a 40% reduction in uh, CO2 emissions by 2050. And that calls into question as to what the strategy should be from now onwards, bearing in mind that the, the further you, you, you uh, push out new initiatives towards the 2050 horizon, the more, more likely it is that they will become very costly. Now, we... We've modeled the, um, what uh, that 2050 objective means for the European Union. Um, it has at the moment um, three um, targets for 2020, which is a 20% reduction in emissions, a 20% uh, uh, share of renewables in energy consumption, which is equivalent to 35% in electricity, and a 20% improvement in energy, in the use of energy. Um, but to get to the 2050 targets, uh, you've got to go a lot further than that. And um, in response to the many commentators, financial and others, who've said that there are so many uncertainties in the European system, intervention of national governments actually <laughs> impeding markets, but at the same time the need for governments to go in and intrude in markets again and to, and to achieve these targets. Um, this roadmap was an attempt to marry up what the current policies are with what the objectives could be and to say what, uh, what could be some kind of no regrets uh, uh, options for all governments irrespective in, in Europe of which uh, particular choice they make on energy mix or, or, or on um, on the balance between regulation and incentive. The first thing to say is that in all the various scenarios we looked at, high, lo high and low nuclear, high level of renewables, uh, greater contribution of CCS, et cetera, et cetera, virtually all the options um, were no more expensive than the likelihood of um, more costs if you ignore the, the climate change cha challenge on the basis of the fears we've got. The second thing is that whether you're Poland with a high level of uh, fossil fuels in your energy mix or France with a uh, high level of nuclear, um, the uh, reality uh, 
to meet these targets is that we're going to have a lot more electricity in the system and a lot more renewables too. On average, at least 66% of um, energy consumption covered by renewables. And the third, no regrets, conclusion from that is, well, if you do have that level of renewables in the system, you probably have a systems problem as such in the sense of providing of building up smarter infrastructures, not just to manage supply, but to manage the response of demand, and actually for that to benefit ultimately uh, consumers. Now, the, the other thing which is pretty obvious, but maybe the only example of where uh, a European-wide solution is a less costly uh, choice than uh, a European solution, and I can tell you that uh, at the moment in Brussels and elsewhere, people are very concerned about how much money is spent on anything which has got the word European on it, <laughs> particularly in this country. Um, and um, one thing is, is fairly clear that it is likely, in almost all circumstances, that uh, providing for generation adequacy, <coughs> providing for uh, ensuring that you have... Um, a control of intermittency from renewables in the network, that the larger the network, the more secure your supply is likely to be. And the larger the network, um, the more opportunity there is for competition across the network to allow new entrants to come in, new technologies to come in, um, uh, getting us away from national markets dominated traditionally by uh, as was pointed out this morning, uh, large public utilities of a vertically integrated kind. And so the, in a sense, achieving even the sustainability objective here is not only is, is, is itself also a reason for going to something which the European Union's member states have been committed to for some time um, and which has been a hard slog and I say that as former Director General of Competition, we had a number of inquiries to, to try to get kick-start, indeed, the creation of competitive um, dynamic in the European Union's markets. Um, the larger the network, better security of supply, the larger the space in which you can compete in electricity and gas, for example, and indeed in heating and cooling more generally, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to exert some kind of downward effect on price. And so far, the, the results are not that, um, not that disappointing, although there are several countries where we still fight with uh, governments about the regulation of both um, consumer prices and prices to industry, I can name two, they're mostly French speaking. Um, the reality today is that we're getting a, a more and more interconnected market in gas uh, and in electricity. Um, perhaps due primarily in the gas side to the two crises we had in 2006 and 2009. It was a wake up call to every single European Union member state. Um, we've got to do something about this. We can't allow gas supplies to be threatened, interrupted, nor can we allow for gas to be, gas supplies to be the subject of major price hikes without some kind of discipline from the market. So there's now a situation where at least 30% of our of gas delivered is delivered uh, on the basis of spot markets at gas hubs. And the, there is heavy pressure on the price, the indexation of um, long-term contracts for gas with our major suppliers. Don't forget, <coughs> not without some degree of um, satisfaction, that Europe has, European countries in the center of Europe have around it a number of countries which have been on the whole, relatively reliable suppliers of um, gas. Norway, in particular, who was part of the, the 
the internal market in, in, uh, in, in Europe in any case, but Russia and Algeria, and um, uh, with the policy towards diversification of routes and supplies towards uh, along a southern corridor towards Azerbaijan and um, Turkmenistan, that too soon. Um, result is that in 2006, there were 15 member states affected by uh, significantly affected by the interruption of gas supplies through the through Ukraine. In 2009, the situation slightly improved, only seven. But when we looked at the situation on the possibility of another interruption at the end of last year, the reality was that only one member state uh, was under threat, and that was Bulgaria. And uh, Bulgarian supplies to Bulgaria would soon be guaranteed better through interconnections with Greece uh, through LNG. So you get a situation today where we have a lot more interconnection in gas, where gas is actually flowing not just in one direction, but in two directions along a pipe. You've got networks, pipelines opening up for business. And that's the, the vision, to, to be able to trade and invest across Europe just like you're able in gas and electricity, as you are in any other uh, major market. And um, in electricity, this is a, not a, a well-known fact here in the EU, because interconnection, although increasing and promise more with Norway and with Ireland already there, um, 17 markets are now coupled in electricity in Europe. 17. Uh, they were coupled primarily in 2011, with the power exchanges therefore operating uh, seamlessly between themselves. Um, over the last three years, there's been a complete elimination of flows of electricity from high-priced areas to low-priced areas. You say, well, why were, they, <laughs> why were they these flows in the first place? The answer was, there was no real market there. <laughs> but because of obstacles to it, regulatory obstacles, physical obstacles. Now, that electricity is flowing everywhere. And um, therefore, talking about a national policy for security of supply <laughs> or generation adequacy in the European Union is becoming more and more difficult, particularly for Germany. Germany, when it, when it uh, shut down part of its nuclear fleet uh, uh, last year, um, became overnight, basically, um, a net importer of electricity. Um, and uh, prices went temporarily up, although they settled down a little bit later. Um, it had always been a net exporter. And yet, at the beginning of uh, this year, when there was a cold spell in France, and the heating in France depends upon electricity and not on gas, um, France imported from the UK imported from significantly from Germany as well. So if you look at the, the rates of exchange across national borders, notwithstanding, for example, the bottlenecks between France and Spain, um, which are being tackled with, with, with more interconnection plan, you see a lot more uh, convergence of price uh, on the German-Dutch border uh, two years ago, you could see for every 24 hours, the, and only 10% of the time was the price the same. I'm talking about wholesale prices. Today, 93% of the time, the prices are the same on both sides of the border. And the prices are moderating as a result. If you look at the prices of commodities actually feeding the electricity price, they have been more or less double uh, in, in increase annual increase to the actual price of the wholesale price, which is actually uh, in the system here. So there's a lot of progress, but there's a lot, a long way to go. Because of course, if you then look at the retail situation, there's a lot, a lot of regulation of prices still going on. Now, regulation for vulnerable customers for energy poverty, as Ivan was pointing out, uh, is very important. Uh, but if the whole population is described as vulnerable, you can't really develop and dynamize retail markets to work in a way 
which was talked about earlier, where consumers can, with the information available, with, with help from regulation, uh, be able to find the best offers, uh, find ways of actually um, making, uh, making uh, getting control of um, the amounts of electricity they earn, even if they can't, uh, they consume, even if they can't uh, consume, uh, uh, control the actual price per kilowatt hour. And of course, that comes back to the, the issue of the, the traditional image of the electricity supply who's saying, well, how, how would I want to help people to uh, reduce energy <laughs> consumption because I'm in the business of selling them a lot more electricity I think this, as you probably know, is only is an argumentation which only applies to monopolists. <laughs> Under normal circumstances, a suppliers complete, compete with each other to provide the best deal for their customers. Um, and that can't be a, a set of deals which can be limited, I don't think, to four or to six. Or It's a question of examining... Uh, what your customers, industrial and ordinary customers, want and adapting your offer to that. When I transferred from director gen being director general of competition to being director of energy uh, nearly three years ago, I actually said in public that I thought the electricity suppliers were in the dark ages as far as um, consumer orientation was concerned. You can imagine I was not very popular. <laughs> in Euroelectric and elsewhere, but I think things are changing. You can hear people, the way people are reacting to it shows that the retail markets have to have a new dynamic of competition in them, and it can't be made more dynamic without some degree of support of hardware and software and information to make it work. Now, I come on to the, the third policy area, not just... Uh, uh, the second policy area, uh, beyond simply that open and integrated market, which is being created and is actually serving the member states of Europe, think, by the way, of Lithuania, um, Latvia, and, um, and Estonia, 100% dependent on uh, Russian gas, actually in the Russian transmission system. Uh, think of... Um, of France at the other, on the other side, who has traditionally said it, it, it benefited nationally from cheap nuclear en electricity. Read the French Court of Auditors report of May this year, where it carried out a calculation of what the real costs of nuclear energy were in France over the whole life cycle of, the, of, the, of construction and implementation. It is true that nuclear and renewables have very, very low incremental costs, but they have very, very high capital costs and very uncertain unconstruction construction costs. And um, there's um, in the nuclear industry, of course, to the issue of the, 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 the um, control of waste, um, nuclear waste, and the whole question as to whether liability uh, should be included in the total cost in the comparison or not. However, if we are going to have a market which, market which is going to work effectively at the wholesale level and at the uh, retail level, we need infrastructures. And one of the things about uh, lessons of the roadmap exercise, when we modeled how... Um, demand and supply in the various countries would be affected, was that, yes, a lot more infrastructures would be needed, but the balance of the investment challenge would be more at the distribution level than at the transmission level. So it is true, we need superhighways and interconnections across Europe, but the actual investments needed, um, if we are to realize... Um, a, a really efficiently uh, efficient and dynamic uh, competitive market in energy are also at the uh, at the distribution level. Now, one of the things which is um, pretty common to virtually every infrastructure <coughs> development, but particularly in energy, is that it takes a long time from the inception of a project to actually implementing it, and most of that time is in public debate and in gr permit granting procedures 
designed to um, ensure that the projects can go ahead. Um, environmental impact assessment is one part of it. Of course, the local uh, opposition to uh, particular develops is another. And this is a very important element in risk management for those who want to invest in this sector. Um, and in Europe, we have, um, maybe it's an advantage in terms of security of supply, but we, in Europe we have a, a, a diversity of views about different en energy technologies. Um, in Austria, they don't even want to say the word nuclear. In Germany, they are definitely against it now. Italy was always against it, so we don't regard that as a major change uh, that they are they, they, when they voted against it, they, they weren't going to vote for it anyway. But on the east of Europe, people are not very convinced that wind, wind turbines and solar panels are going to provide them an effective energy choice uh, compared with Russian gas. It just doesn't work as a, as a subject. They're, they are very interested in interconnection. They are interested in seeing supplies of electricity and gas coming in from uh, elsewhere in Europe. But they say, don't ask us to simply rely on uh, our own uh, renewable energy. So we need to see to what extent the, the time taken to actually get these projects going is reduced. And it takes into account these issues of public acceptance. In the UK, um, uh, I think, uh, as was mentioned earlier, onshore wind um, is, is not going to be ever popular. <laughs> offshore wind is very expensive. The fact is that, and as the graph showed, I mean, onshore wind and solar has come down significantly in costs, uh, but um, we don't have the same uh, degree of um, confidence uh, for offshore. So there again, maybe... Um, in the situation of uncertainty about which technologies are going to be profitable, um, some degree of interconnection and some better systems management and better demand response management is an absolutely essential part of the, um, of, of the, of the solution. And we don't just have to take into account permit granting procedures. Obviously, in Europe, if we're going to actually invest in smarter infrastructures, um, we've got to make sure that there is some degree of um, consensus on other issues. One is, what are the priorities? Which lines should be built and which countries should be involved? And do our national regulators agree on, on how much money should be uh, earned on each of these lines? Because they are part of effectively a regulated asset base in each country. And... Um, one recent piece of legislation which we're trying to get through now, which is almost decided this week, is, uh, includes not just cutting down the permit granting period to three and a half years based upon a one-stop one -shop, one shop principle, but also to try and get uh, regulatory convergence. In the Nordic area, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, etc., they already carry out cost-benefit analysis of different interconnections and different projects for the, for the, for the area as a whole with the result that um, there's no argument about which connections will be beneficial to different countries. Um, that's, that's calculated in the whole scheme. So focusing on certain priorities, getting, getting, um, getting uh, uh, going in terms of, um, of uh, speeding up permit granting procedures is essential. Emphasis on the distribution side is, is going to be critical. Now, if you then talk to financial institutions about why they're not re-engaging in, in energy investments in, this, in the energy sector in Europe, they, well, Citibank said the sector is uninvestable. Uh, KPNG said, well, there's plenty of money there, but there's um, not enough good projects. Um, we often ask them, well, which sector is, is better for you for the long term? Which sector can provide you with more certainty 
in, in terms of risk-free rates of return than this one? Uh, well, they say, yeah, well, sort out your sovereign debt problems first. <laughs> then we can move on and see whether we want to invest in those countries anyway because the level of economic growth is very low. And thirdly, why would we want to invest in these areas when we could perhaps uh, import from neighboring countries into Europe and why don't you help us with interconnections there? There's a big, big investment gap, but there's a big financing challenge. And um, I think the, the role of um, not just national governments, but the European government, the European system together is to try to provide that predictability and certainty which will make things happen. And there's no better area to start thinking about this not just in, for en uh, infrastructures, but also energy efficiency. And the panel and um, um, Dr. Martin talked about it too. The World Energy Outlook for 2012 makes energy efficiency the theme uh, for the future. It is the cheapest form of electricity generation. Um, and it's taken a long time for uh, at the political level for us to get this kind of logic uh, uh, accepted, and that is, don't just look at the returns from individual in investments in energy efficiency in a building or in your own company. Collectively, for governments and for industry, um, we have to take into account what is the opportunity cost of not investing in energy efficiency, and one key element is the amount of investment you'd have to do in generation and in transmission and uh, uh, networks to, to cope with more electricity having to be produced. And of course, you, you have to also look at the impact, uh, the, uh, global impact on electricity bills. Now, energy efficiency is something for everyone. It, it's not a negative concept. It's about improving our use of energy. Um, and uh, it makes sense if people know what they can benefit from and whether they have the incentive to do so. Um, and essentially, probably most of the successful initiatives um, start locally or start inside a, a company. But to a certain extent, there is a need for some degree of targeting and some binding measures to ensure that um, uh, products, systems, um, buildings, are managed in a way which uh, uh, respects some degree of energy efficiency standards. And you'll be well aware, because you've all been in the supermarkets, um, if you buy a fridge or if you buy a, any kind of domestic appliance, you have um, uh, labeling, which indicates what is the level of energy efficiency of those products. So you can either buy something which is really cheap, but is going to be very expensive if you use it um, if you're consuming energy from it, you can buy something which is very, very uh, low in energy cost, but it's likely to cost you a lot more at the beginning. That process, that uh, this echo design labeling is something which Japan does, which the US does, and which the European Union does overall. We're moving into a whole area of products now which is much more significant for energy efficiency, boilers, ventilators, coolers. These things really, really make the the um, the meters go round so I suppose the real challenge beyond the regulation at national and European level and there's a new uh, set of directives uh, at the European level on on uh, improving energy efficiency um, public sector should take the lead public procurement should take into account uh, energy efficiency objectives um, um, buildings in the public sector should be renovated at a faster rate than the average 1.5% retrofit, which is, uh, which is common to everywhere. Um, these measures need to be nevertheless uh, accompanied by a degree of innovation in the way in which we, they're financed. And everywhere in Europe, we're still faced with the challenge of finding the right legal structures to, for example, combine benefits 
for tenants in reduction of electricity bills <coughs> or heating bills with benefits for owners and the level of, level of, uh, re, uh, of returns required by banks and other finance, financiers. If we move on now to the, the response on, uh, which I referred to earlier of, uh, on, on uh, reducing emissions. There's a lot of debate in, in the UK about a renewable target. That there isn't a European target on re renewables. There isn't a European imposed target on the UK for renewables. There is a UK self-imposed target in the context of a set of targets which were agreed for 2020 to achieve the overall uh, result of a 20% share of renewables in energy consumption. Now, if you're market-oriented, which I think you are and I am, um, I don't like the idea of... Um, the, the driver for a particular technology being entirely subsidy. Uh, yeah. Because then, uh, what is the ultimate aim? Well, the ultimate aim in 2008 was simply to, to, to have a scale effect so that costs could, could, could come down rapidly. And that was done on the basis of national systems of support, of which there are many, and they've all tried out different systems as to what is the best way to do it, by feed-in tariffs, by feed-in premium, by quota models, etc. Now we're getting to a situation of much more maturity in, in the way in which um, these, these things are done. And uh, it looks that we, the 20% the uh, objective of, in, of total energy consumption will be achieved, um, but the way in which it is being done is being through um, support, subsidy support, is being um, significantly altered. Um, and of course, um, though some of our hedge funds and um, private equity didn't realize it at the beginning, the aim of this policy was for degressivity <laughs> in the system. That is to say, uh, yes, you are subsidized for the investment you make at a particular time, but if you make a further investment in wind farms or in, in solar, you can't expect the same level of uh, subsidy if the costs in the meantime have gone down significantly, and they have for, for solar and for onshore wind. We've referred earlier, and this is my last slide, and I'm sorry it's a bit of a um, cheesecake, um, to the various areas in which necessarily national governments and, and the European Commission are, are looking at supporting the strategy uh, to moving towards a low carbon economy but maintaining competitiveness the issue of development of s grids and storage is essential. Um, the <coughs> issue of finding uh, hardware and software solutions in energy efficiency remains vital. Uh, renewables uh, research is becoming less uh, a, a, a source of concern because for precisely what uh, our panel members pointed out, that there are... Um, <laughs> There are plenty of existing technologies which um, need refinement and development, but we're not necessarily talking about um, um, uh, groundbreaking changes. Whereas in the area of biofuels, bioenergy, we've had a big problem. Ten years ago, everyone said biofuels was the absolute answer to the transport sector. We'd have more biofuels in the sector. This would mean that the transport sector would have a... a much more reliable, uh, renewable source of energy. First generation biofuels have basically been given the thumbs down by society as a whole due to the, the, uh, the, the doubts about their sustainability and their impact on land use um, worldwide. And so there's a major issue as to, where, to what extent we can invest in second generation biofuels using waste, uh, using algae, other sources of, of, of material, which uh, don't put pressure on the agricultural system and don't put pressure on land use. And of course, coming back to what is said earlier about uh, heat, geothermal, um, uh, combined heat and storage remains a big, big challenge which uh, we can't avoid. So, probably Europe has more challenges 
alongside Japan than any other region of the world for its energy system. Partly because it is sticking to the um, to its view that um, mitigating climate change is not as sensible as preparing for it. Um, but if if you then look at it simply from a security of supply point of view, with depletion of um, indigenous reserves in, in gas and oil, it's absolutely clear that development of indigenous sources, including um, renewables, if they can get to grid, grid parity, would be a major advantage and a major moderation for um, uh, the European Union on its, on its dependence on uh, fossil fuels from outside and the volatility of prices. Making the market work at a wholesale level and at a retail level is uh, in the interest of everyone. Um, using energy better is going to become the, the, the focus for investment, for innovation in, in the way we finance things. Um, we need to prepare for more electricity, more, more renewables, smart, we need smarter grids. The consumer empowerment uh, offered by smart meters should enable us to manage demand as well as supply effectively. And we rely very, very heavily in a low-carbon agenda on uh, innovation for new fuels <coughs> in particular. Um, if we can't go for renewables in transport, why not a lot more use of uh, gas in the transport sector? That's a, a clear contribution to CO2 reduction. Uh, with less risk than in other areas. We're about to have to uh, come forward now with an updating of the overall European Union strategy for the, um, for the next 10 years. Um, maybe it'll have less targets. It'll certainly be more mar market-oriented in terms of support for renewables. But nevertheless, the sense of direction I don't, don't think is likely to change. Thank you. Uh, Davide Pagnotta, uh, LBS alum and uh, now marketing director of Doosan. Um, I heard something, I'm not sure I read the data properly, uh, correctly, but well, something you said at the beginning. Uh, you said that Europe is at the forefront of uh, renewables, and I'm happy to hear that. But our uh, energy prices are twice as high as the uh, Americans, and uh, we haven't built any local industry because solar is made in China, and our wind companies in Europe are all in crisis. And, um, and we have increased uh, emissions. So you, you just mentioned that the direction is clear, but is it the right direction that where we're going? First question is, do we disagree with the two degrees ceiling target for uh, global emissions? If we agree with it globally, then what should be the implication for the EU? Well, first of all, it should continue to fight for some global consensus on uh, climate change um, action. Uh, but it's also got to prepare itself for a situation where it, is, it has to simply fight for its res resources on its own. If it's fighting for resources on its own, um, well, exponential Asian demand is going to put pressure on coal, on, on gas, on fuel generally. Um, so the next question is, um, to what extent is the uh, investment in uh, renewables something which is good from the point of view of security of supply and long-term competitiveness, and has it any industrial policy advantages? I, I don't tend to agree with you that the, um, the, um, the technological advantages which Europe developed, and I'm talking particularly about in Spain, in Denmark, and Germany, have disappeared. They have not disappeared. What, di what, they fail, what we in Europe failed to do was to realize that um, there could have been mass production of solar panels, for example, in Europe. It wasn't a question of labor costs. It was simply a question of the ambition 
to do, to create, to produce these solar panels here in Europe. It wasn't done. It was done by our own companies in conjunction with Chinese companies in China. And the result is we've got uh, a technology which is, at least from the point of view of its contribution to the electricity price, now something approaching in, by 2015 grid parity. That can't be a bad thing as a final result, but we've lost an opportunity to export <laughs> uh, more significantly the technologies which have been developed in Europe. The same is true of carbon capture and storage for the moment. We're hesitating, we, governments and private industry, are hesitating. Uh, we've tried to get governments and companies to focus in maybe two projects instead of six or 12. Europe has the biggest challenges in this area and it is missing out. Uh, it could miss out considerably if it doesn't stick to some commitment to longer term development of the technologies, which makes sense. Now, should we simply give up, blink, <laughs> and say, uh, no, uh, we, we'll, just, uh, we'll just pay the Russian gas price. Certainly not. I've referred to the, the issue of, of um, long-term pricing of, of, of gas in the Euro US. The creation of this open market in gas has actually brought LNG in. It's now contestable with Russian gas. There's nothing wrong with Russian gas, but there's something wrong with weighting it against the price against oil over 30 years. <laughs> there should be a considerable influence, in influence of spot prices. This is good for Europe. So stick to some kind of long-term industrial policy in the area of renewables, because that will give us these, these uh, ultimately indigenous, lower-priced e energy in comparison with um, <coughs> importing fossil fuels and stick to this idea of getting a market which is open for everyone, where new entrants can come in and provide the, the best uh, deal. <coughs>